For those of you tuning in, I'm Daryl Kimball with the Arms Control Association, and this is part two, the second half of the 2023 Arms Control Association annual meeting. Um, our next panel uh, is focused on a topic that we got into a little bit uh, earlier this morning, the challenge of reducing nuclear risks and reinforcing the taboos against nuclear use and nuclear threats. Now, so far, the almost 78-year-old taboo against the use of nuclear weapons has held, but we, of course, cannot take that for granted. Uh, as we've discussed through the course of the day, Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, along with his threats of nuclear use in February, April, and September 2022, raised the specter of nuclear conflict in ways that we haven't seen in a long, long time. Uh, they undermine nuclear weapon states' negative security assurances to uh, non-nuclear weapon states like Ukraine. Uh, you will recall that President Biden warned of the grave risks back in October. He said, uh, quite alarmingly, I don't think there's any such thing as the ability to easily use a tactical nuclear weapon and not end up with Armageddon. That's, in tr that's true in part because of the security policies that our lunch and speaker Alice Comment just described of all of the major nuclear armed states that involve the threat of nuclear weapons use under extreme circumstances, um, uh, which we've been living with for, for about decades. Um, now, uh, as Ambassador Comment also talked about, and as we'll get into a little bit more depth here in this discussion, uh, civil society, non nuclear weapon states, and other nuclear weapon states have sought to push back against Russia's nuclear threats in different ways and perhaps with some limited success for now. Uh, and we see some of this expressed in, in last month's G7 Hiroshima vision statement on nuclear disarmament, which said that Russia's irresponsible nuclear rhetoric, undermining arms control regimes, et cetera, um, are dangerous and unacceptable. They recalled the Bali uh, statement of G20 leaders, which included Russia. Uh, condemning nuclear weapons use and threats. And the G7 in Hiroshima said, our position is that threats by Russia of nuclear weapons use, let alone any use of nuclear weapons by Russia in the context of its aggression against Ukraine are inadmissible. So for now, it appears, and maybe my panelists may disagree, uh, Vladimir Putin seemed to have backed off at least rhetorically uh, regarding uh, nuclear threats although there are other kinds of nuclear signaling going on. But as the war continues, uh, and we still, of course, don't know how this um, horrific uh, conflict is going to end, the, we are going to be living under the heightened state of uh, nuclear war and nuclear threats. So we designed this panel to explore how we in civil society, how governments, including those with and without nuclear weapons, can best preserve and strengthen the consensus against nuclear weapons use and threats of use. And I think we've got four of the very best people <clears throat> to address this very challenging topic. And it is a challenging and complex uh, topic. We have with us the one and only Mort Halperin. It's a pleasure to have Mort with us. Um, he, of course, has served as a senior official in arms control and defense matters in the Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and Clinton administrations. Um, and it's just a remarkable record that Mort has, a remarkable uh, set of experiences and insights. And of course, he wrote the book on nuclear arms control uh, a couple of years before I was born, and we're still following some of its dictates. Um, we also have Professor Rebecca uh, Davis Gibbons with the University of Southern Maine. Uh, and co-chair of the Beyond Nuclear Deterrence Working Group at the Harvard Project on Managing the Atom. It's great to have you all the way down from New England, where I hope it's a little cooler outside than it is here in Washington. And we have the one and only Amy Wolf, um, who has been a resource for those of us inside government, especially in Congress and outside government for many years on nuclear weapons, arms control, uh, uh, policy issues. Um, she's now a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Uh, and of course served for many years as a senior analyst at the Congressional Research Service. So they're full bios within their program. Um, I'm gonna be asking each of them uh, some questions to kick off the discussion. Um, feel free to add or veer from the, uh, the concepts that I put before you. 
uh, so we can have a conversation and feel free to respond to one another. And I wanted to start uh, with, with Mort, um, and I wanted to ask you, Mort, to just kind of ground us uh, with your interpretation of what the purpose of Putin's threats that we saw last year, uh, threats of nuclear weapons use, um, were all about, what was his, his intentions, uh, and what makes those threats any different or similar to the nuclear weapons threats that um, we saw during the course of the Cold War uh, between the US and the Soviet Union. Well, <clears throat> thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the invitation. Let me start with what was different. This was the first threat of the use of nuclear weapons made by a nuclear weapon state against a non-nuclear weapon state, which was party to the NPT. And the reaction to it, in my view, was extraordinary. Many countries that support Russia or remain neutral in the Ukraine overall conflict nevertheless condemn this, appropriately con condemn this, as dangerous, reckless, and ineffective. And I interpret the Biden statement in contrast to, say, Kennedy's statement during the Cuban Missile Crisis in which he threatened a massive nuclear strike, that he threatened a massive strike, but not necessarily, and I think intentionally, not necessarily nuclear, and began a discussion, which I think we need to continue, of recognizing that no second use is as essential as no first use, and no second use is as dangerous as no first use. And that, of course, goes to the whole question of nuclear deterrent. But I think what Putin was trying to do was to prevent the West, the NATO in particular, <coughs> from, from, <coughs> from intervening in the conflict. And I think he failed in that. And I think he understood he failed. If you go through the litany, he goes back and forth of whether he's threatening nuclear weapons anymore or not. But I think the fact is nobody takes those threats seriously and everybody understands that the world has deemed them reckless and inappropriate. So we still have to worry about it, but I think we also need to begin to focus on what use can we make of it to advance the goal of further stigmatizing and increasing the moratorium on the use of nuclear weapons. And I think the time has come, this is the moment to seize, to get something that's long been sought, which is a negative security assurance from the five nuclear weapon states in the, in the NPT that's legally binding, that's uniform, and that's comprehensive. And I think the time can come for that. The Chinese are continuing to push even for more, for no first use in general. The French have said their nuclear weapons will not be used in the Ukraine conflict. Uh, and the United States has condemned the Russian use. I interpret the uh, G7 summit language about in these circumstances to mean a threat by a nuclear weapon state against a non-nuclear weapon state. And the other point to keep in mind is that, well, as we were reminded this morning, the nuclear posture review, or the Biden nuclear posture review, walked back his statement about uh, sole purpose. It did not walk back the statement that was in the Obama uh, nuclear posture review that we would not threaten or use nuclear weapons against a non-nuclear weapon state in good standing in the, in the NPT. And clearly, they looked carefully at what they could continue from Obama and what they could not. So I think, as Joe Stalin would have said, it was not an accident that that provision is left in. And nothing that NATO has said, nothing that the United States has said since then suggests that the United States could not support, without changing any aspect of its current policy, a global, legally binding negative security assurance. There are two ways of doing that. One is to amend the NPT to include a provision that puts this obligation on the nuclear weapon states. The other way to do it, which is faster and equally effective, is for the Security Council to adopt a resolution, as it did on nuclear testing, which says that it's it decides that any threat or use of nuclear weapons against a non-nuclear weapon state in good standing in the NPT is a threat to peace and security, and that makes it legally binding. Now, I, I would suggest that the United States begin this process uh, 
by talking to the Chinese and hopefully come forward with a Chinese-American proposal which is consistent, doesn't go as far as the Chinese go, but is consistent with the nuclear policy statements of those two countries and then try to build out from that. Now, I think there's some chance that the Russians will not veto it. But even if they do, we'll have made substantial progress. And then we go to option two, which is to make it an amendment to the, to the non-proliferation treaty, which comes into effect when it's by, ratified. I think it's by 50% of the members. But in any case, it does not require unanimity, as I understand it. Uh, but it's a way forward that I think, while not saying that threat from Putin is over, is to seize the threat to move forward with another step that increases the stigma attached to nuclear weapons. All right, great. I mean, there are going to be a number of strategies that we need to consider and deploy uh, to push back on, on, on nuclear threats and use, and, and, and that's, that's a really important contribution, Mort. Um, I want to turn to, to uh, Professor Rebecca Davis Gibbons about, um, well, the taboo against nuclear weapons use is widely understood, but it's not widely understood. Uh, it's widely subscribed to, but there are variations in how it's subscribed to. Uh, I mean, first, I wanted you to just explain from your perspective looking at this issue, what is the taboo? Um, uh, briefly, and then how have non-nuclear weapon states in the past year or so, and we heard a bit of this from Alex Kement, responded to the situation uh, regarding Russia's threats against Ukraine, uh, and what effect has that response from the TPNW states and others had on the situation in your analysis? Great. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be on this panel uh, with you three. Uh, in terms of the taboo, you know, we all talk about that tab taboo. We see it talked about in the media. I, I prefer to think of it as a norm of non-use. Uh, it's a pattern of behavior. Some call it a tradition. But I would argue that there are many open questions about the nuclear taboo. One of them is, what is this taboo based upon? So there's some scholars. Nina Tannenwald, of course, is most associated with the concept of the nuclear taboo. She wrote the book about it. And for her, it is based on um, a moral revulsion for what nuclear weapons can do, right? But then there's other scholars who say this tradition, this pattern that we have is actually based on a, more of a strategic logic, a logic of precedent. So I don't want to be the first to use nuclear weapons because I'm breaking that precedent, and then I worry kind of what that will open up. Um, Scott Sagan has ascribed to this, this opinion and talks about um, a former U.S. general saying we don't want to, like I said, we don't want to, Get the, bring the genie out of the bottle, kind of the idea that if we do it, then someone else will do it. And I would argue those are two very different logics. And whether you have second use after a first use, in some ways, is based on whether there's moral revulsion towards use or whether this is more of a precedent and that you, you wouldn't want to be the first one to kind of start that precedent and then kind of open the box for other countries to feel more comfortable using nuclear weapons. So that's one question we have, the basis of the taboo. Another question is just how widespread it is. I would argue that there are certain countries where the taboo is very strong. I think a lot of the countries that are states parties in the TPNW, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, for them it is quite strong. When I think of a country where it's strong, I think of Mexico, who has long uh, been against nuclear weapons. But then there's other states where I don't think the taboo is as strong. I, I, I'm guessing it's not as strong in South Korea, where you do get uh, public opinion polls indicating that they would be open to an indigenous nuclear weapons program. So that's the second question. And then there's the question of where the taboo resides in the state. Is it in the minds of our president? Is it in the minds of the elite, the leaders, Congress? Or is it in the minds of the people? And does that matter? Uh, there was a, uh, some scholarship that came out a couple years ago that got a lot of attention where um, some American scholars were able to get the public, the American public, to say they'd be willing to use nuclear weapons in certain contingencies. They looked at terrorist attacks, they looked at Iran, and by and large, you could get Americans to be in favor of nuclear use against non-nuclear entities if it were to save American lives. And so since then, there's been a whole lot of scholarship trying to um, undermine that original study. And what we see is that how you frame your question about nuclear weapons and nuclear use can get very, you get very different answers. So I would argue 
if, it's, if, if the taboo is in the public, then it's very malleable, depending on who's in power and how it's framed. And so maybe we say, oh, the taboo is amongst the, the elite, the decision makers. But again, how widespread is that? And so I think it's important in this discussion to, to really think about what the taboo means and how much constraining power it has and what it's actually based upon. I think the uh, humanitarian consequences movement has been important in talking about kind of the moral ramifications, but there's more to the story than just that. And then the second part of the question in terms of responses to uh, Russian rhetoric, Russian signaling about nuclear weapons. I mean, we did have in the UN General Assembly, we've had five emergency resolutions. The first one last March explicitly mentioned nuclear weapons. So it condemned the decision of the Russian Federation to increase the readiness of its nuclear forces. And 141 states voted in favor of that resolution. The four resolutions since, you have variation in support. Um, I think what's interesting across these resolutions is that the number of states that are either abstaining or actually just leaving the room, leaving New York City, and deciding they don't want to be on the record in either direction, right? Maybe they don't want countries in the West and the US to be upset with their vote. They also don't want to be seen um, going against Russia. And so we see this a little bit, we saw this a little bit also in the first meeting of states parties for the TPNW where the opening statements and opening statements were allowed by any states that were present. So there were observer states that were there that are not members of the treaty, many from um, Europe. And all the European members harshly criticized Russian actions, but few other states did. It was very noticeable. Um, and this is a meeting for a treaty which in its first, in Article 1, it prohibits nuclear threats, right? And yet you had people unwilling. So I think we see that, and, and I think this was a little surprising to me and maybe it's surprising to others, but how many friends that maybe Russia has in the world and maybe, maybe we thought that kind of Western opinion or that, that other countries would go along with NATO and the United States and our alliance system in this, and that would be kind of a no-brainer. You know, one country attack the territorial um, sovereignty or integrity of another, that they would come out and kind of be on the same page as the US, and yet, and yet we, really, we really don't see that. And so to me, the bottom line, and I'm sorry I'm going on, I'll wrap up. I'm an academic, so you know, it's hard. Um, is that I see this as just part of the contest that we're in globally about the rules-based order and kind of what are the norms and standards of this order and who um, is going to play the middle. And there's a lot of reasons for the Global South or less powerful states to say, to say I don't want to take sides because I want benefits from both, as countries did during the Cold War. Um, but I think we're seeing that the fact that there is this divide when it comes to the war in Ukraine and who's willing to criticize Russia. Yeah, yeah. All right, and I'm going to come back to you, Rebecca, about how we bridge that divide and how we build consensus around reinforcing the taboo. Um, but first, I wanted to um, go to, 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 to Amy Wolf uh, to give us your assessment of the particular situation that we've seen over the last year and, and how the Biden administration and NATO responded in 2022 and even up to today um, through diplomacy, the military assistance, their statements, their own nuclear posture to Russia's threats and what explains that and you know what realistically and this is the the hard question and I want you to help bring us down to reality here or uh, you know on the record on the record all right and and you don't no longer work for CRS so you can say whatever the heck you want um, what options does President Biden have uh, realistically if Putin were to uh, threat nuclear weapons use again or Help God help us actually use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Are there kinetic options uh, that don't risk Armageddon, as Biden suggested back in October? So, to you, the, the easy questions, Amy. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, I'm really happy to be here, one of my favorite annual meetings. Um, I'm kind of stuck here between Mort Halpern, who I learned everything I know about nuclear weapons and arms control from, and Rebecca Davis who, Gibbons, who I've known for years and is one of my role models in how to teach this stuff. So I'm going to try and bridge this gap here. But I'm going to start by saying I agree with Mort when he says that Russia's nuclear threats have been a means for Russia to try and limit NATO's and the US engagement in the conflict. But I want to change the wording a little bit because 
Russia hasn't actually issued nuclear threats. They haven't said, if you do X, we will or we even may use nuclear weapons. What Russia has done has reminded us that it has nuclear weapons that it could use in certain circumstances. And you may think I'm splitting hairs here, but if you think of Russia's statements as a reminder rather than a direct threat, it provides the United States, NATO, the international community with a broader range of response options because you are not focused just on, oh my gosh, what do we do if that nuclear weapon explodes? Um, I also want to point out that there have been in the response categories things that have happened behind the scenes, things that have happened in public, and things that have happened behind the scenes that have been reported in public. And I'm going to refer to these things, apologies to Ambassador Komet, as deterrence. But I don't mean deterrence through the threat of offensive nuclear retaliation. I mean deterrence as a reminder to Russia of what the consequences are of its pursuit of this. So I'll come back to that. But basically, in the initial round of Russian threats at the beginning in February and March, Russia's goal was to convince the United States and NATO to cease and desist, to back off and not get involved in the conflict. Now, we know that that was somewhat successful. There are not US or NATO boots on Russian ground, I mean on Ukrainian ground. There are not NATO or US airplanes in the skies above Ukraine. There was no no-fly zone imposed. And there was a sense of caution in the response that we brought to the table in those early days. We had the reminder. We didn't need it. We knew Russia had nuclear weapons. It also wasn't solely about the nuclear uh, reminder. It was also a fact that Ukraine's not in NATO. But NATO's and the US response was measured. Now, we did come on full bore bringing nuclear, uh, non-nuclear conventional support, military support, diplomatic support to Ukraine. But even in that, it's been somewhat measured over time, seeking to avoid escalation and not cross red lines. And we don't know where the red lines are. So Russia's initial reminder, although we didn't need it to be measured, actually did seem to have some effect. Now, with the behind the scenes military planning, there was reporting pretty early on that the administration set up what I guess the press was calling a tiger team to look at what options the United States and NATO would have, and I know this has happened in NATO as well, if Russia were to employ a nuclear weapon, what the response would be. There was also very early reporting that they were only looking at conventional options. Now, I don't know how in-depth or accurate that reporting is. I would suspect they looked at all options and found that options that weren't conventional but were nuclear were either unnecessary or over the top and maybe set those aside. But that kind of planning isn't designed to, uh, designed to come up with a single answer, what do we do if Russia uses nuclear weapons? It's designed to recognize that we don't know what the circumstances would be, and we have a range of options, and we'd pick from the best option at the time. Now, that happened behind the scenes, but it was widely reported in the press, which is a mes message to Russia as a deterrent that we're ready. Um, Something else that happened behind the scenes where there were political meetings, a political response. Jake Sullivan went and met with a Russian cohort. Um, the head of the CIA uh, went and met with a Russian cohort. And the reporting in the press was they were delivering the message that if you use nuclear weapons, the consequences will be unacceptable. Now, they didn't tell us in public what the consequences would be. But when asked, they said, no, we were specific and serious about these consequences. That is also a deterrence message to try and affect Russia's decision on whether or not to brandish its weapons again or even use one. The third layer of this deterrence was the international community, whether it's the UN resolutions, the statements at the G7 and the G20 at the TPNW, NATO statements. The international community has spoken with one voice pretty much 90% of the time about how inadmissible, unacceptable it would be for Russia to use nuclear weapons, and that there would be costs. So what are these costs that are being presented to Russia? There's the military costs of the military planning. There's economic costs. There's political costs. There's costs related to breaking the nuclear taboo. We don't know if those reminders to Putin had anything to do with his backing off the nuclear reminders to us. But they seem to coincide. Now, correlation isn't causation. But there was a deterrent effect of this political, military, and diplomatic 
wall that was put up in front of him to remind him of the costs. So on the question of whether this type of deterrent will succeed or what we would do if it failed, I have no idea. I mean, the you know, realistic options range from do nothing. You know, when he threatened Ukraine with nuclear use if they continued to fight the war against the recently annexed territories, Ukraine ignored them. So, you know, maybe ignoring the threats, as Mort said, they've got no currency right now. You could do that, or at the out end, you could punish nuclear use with nuclear use, but that's not US policy. US policy is to find a military tool that affects the military outcome and denies the military benefits of using the nuclear weapons. I'm not a military planner, so I don't know what those tools are. But as I said, they've considered a range of conventional uh, options that they could use in response. Now, you asked if um, there's any kinetic response that could be used without risking nuclear Armageddon. And no, there's no kinetic, re there's no response that, I mean, everything brings risk. And it is about the risk. The goal of deterring Putin from threatening or using nuclear weapons is to affect his risk calculus, to say, you won't get away with it, you won't have benefits from the military use, you will have costs. But escalation is unpredictable. And any kinetic engagement between the United States, NATO, and Russia has the risk of escalating. And we don't know where Putin's red lines are. We don't know what would trigger an escalation on his side. So we, on our side, have to balance those risks against the risks of not being prepared and not being willing to employ some kind of kinetic action in response to use. It is a risk management, risk calculation, risk reduction opportunity. Thank you for taking us through that, that, that difficult uh, logic. I mean, let me, let me just tease one thing out a little bit further, and you know, more, you in particular might want to weigh in here, because you've been in these wargaming scenarios uh, through many administrations, I'm sure. I mean, but Amy, you say any kinetic, in response to the question asked about kinetic option, options, and is there any that doesn't risk nuclear Armageddon? Um, why? All right, and I'm just going to ask you to respond to some suggestions that have been made by pundits and some quasi-experts about what should be done if Russia were to use a handful of short-range nuclear weapons in Ukrainian territory to somehow turn the tide of the war. All right, um, Using nuclear weapons in that way, the United States should, some people say, uh, blow up the Black Fleet, uh, the Black Sea Fleet. Uh, they should, uh, with conventional forces. The United States should use conventional force to hit back at the air bases uh, where, from which the Russians fired these nuclear weapons. Um, what's wrong with that? Why isn't that proportional? Why isn't that effective? And why, 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 why does that risk Armageddon? What's the next step? I mean, it is. it may be quite proportional. It may be an effective message sender that you hit Zaporizhia with a nuclear weapon or whatever it is they want to hit, and we're going to use conventional force to take out the base that launched that weapon. Then what's Putin going to say? Oh, I give up. You're right. No. It, you know, we don't know what Putin would do next. The Russian nuclear doctrine is pretty specific about the circumstances of Russian nuclear use being affected to the survival of the state, but we don't know how Putin defines that. Is it you know, is he made it clear or tried to make it clear that the survival of the state included the territorial integrity of land he had stolen from Ukraine? Um, is it the survival of Putin equal to the survival of the state? We don't know how he would interpret that. That's the whole problem right. with risk-seeking behavior on his part and escalation after risk. We would be taking risks as well. We're not seeking them, but if you're trying to manipulate risk to deter your adversary from engaging, you're very likely to miscalculate. And we can't be sure. So when I say there's always a chance that it'll escalate to Armageddon, I don't mean step one is Ukraine is hit with a few nuclear weapons. Step two is the United States takes out the Black Sea fleet. And step three is Putin goes to Armageddon. 
there are many intervening steps. We just don't know what they are or how they'll unroll, and so there's always a risk. Yeah. Which, going back to what Joe Biden said in October of 2022, he seems to understand the logic that you're describing. You know, I don't think there's any such thing as an ability to easily use a tactical nuclear weapon and not end up with Armageddon, which was a really mind-blowing statement uh, the day that that came out. But part of the problem was, again, getting to the press reporting, which I'm not particularly fond of, but that's a remnant of CRSness in me. Um, it was reported at almost as if Biden said, if Putin uses any nuclear weapon in any circumstance, we're going to blast him with all the nuclear weapons we have. We're going to go to Armageddon. Whereas what he was saying is, we don't know how this would unroll, and it could get there just through escalation. And it's in contrast to what Kennedy said in the Cuban Missile Crisis, in which he said, if the Russians use a single, if a single nuclear weapon is used at, from Cuba, we will fire all of our weapons. So he did say that we will produce Armageddon if there's a single weapon used. Yeah, I mean, just to build on your point more, I mean, Biden has been conspicuously restrained in his statements in response to what Putin said. Um, he has not issued counter threats. He, there have been, as Amy said, these uh, communications through channels about there will be consequences, right. but he has not publicly and these, issued a counter threat. These undermine the notion that we need a nuclear deterrent even to deter a nuclear threat. And we've done the same thing with the North Koreans. We had told the North Koreans and the South Koreans years ago that the response to a North Korean use of nuclear weapons would not necessarily be a nuclear one and more likely to be a conventional threat in which we eliminated the North Korean regime. So we have been moving, I think, in a way that's not been noticed very much, away from the notion that deterrence requires a threat of nuclear weapons, whether it's conventional attack or a nuclear attack. Yeah, yeah. deterrence comes in different forms, as you were saying, right. Amy. So let me come back to what you were speaking about, Mort, and I want to have uh, Rebecca or Amy also engage in that, this, this, this question. But you brought up this. I think very interesting idea of you know how can the United States and other nations, particularly non-nuclear weapon states, uh, reinforce the negative security assurances by nuclear weapon states towards non-nuclear weapon states in light of everything that's happened in the context of Ukraine, um, and um, you know we also have in the, in this conversation we've got Belarus. <laughs> now entering the conversation, accepting Russia's offer, or maybe it was Belarus' request for uh, Russian uh, uh, nuclear weapons on its soil. But um, let's, let's explore and, 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 and consider how could this be affected, all right? I mean, uh, I just want to push back in a little bit. Amending the NPT is not an easy task. Um, Security Council resolutions work when the Security Council uh, is effective, but as of late, it's been difficult. I mean, how could support for such an initiative be built? Um, I mean, what kinds of, what diplomatic strategy would you, would you outline? And, and Amy or Rebecca, I mean, just going well, with this idea, I mean, what, what thoughts do you have about what would be needed to, to advance that if? Uh, I, would, I would start if I was the US government with the Chinese. We heard this morning that there's an interest in engaging the Chinese on nuclear issues. This one is much more ripe. As you know, the Chinese have said for years and have reiterated in the context of Ukraine that they are against the use of nuclear weapons in any circumstance against any state. Uh, and the Chinese, back when the NPT was renewed, they were the only one of the five nuclear weapon states who offered and an assurance, we're willing to offer an assurance that was binding, legally binding, comprehensive, uh, and uniform. They were the only one. The other four did not. So I think this is a Chinese issue, and the United States should go to the Chinese because it will be much more likely to succeed if it comes to the Security Council as a Chinese U.S. resolution. Certainly Britain and France will not veto. The votes, I think, would be there for it. And then Russia would have to decide whether it was willing to take the pressure and the and 
impact on its security if it isolated itself by vetoing that kind of resolution. Hopefully the states that are parties to the Treaty Against Nuclear Weapons would all vigorously support this. I think many European countries that still accept a U.S. nuclear deterrent would nevertheless support this as different from that. Uh, and if it failed, you then build the case. You go to the General Assembly, you get an overwhelming resolution. You go to the NTPT conference, if you can't do an amendment to the treaty, you do a concluding statement if the Russians veto it, further isolates the Russians, and you keep at it until you get it. It's what we did on the test ban. Remember, Kennedy wanted a complete test ban. They couldn't get it, they were close to an agreement on how many inspections to require, and it failed, and instead of Kennedy walking away, which many people urged him to do, you either ban nuclear tests or you don't, he said, we'll take what we can get, and we took what we can get, and then we struggled for the rest. So I think we should take the negative security assurance for non-nuclear states if we can get it, and even if we can't get it, we should take building pressure on it so that there's pressure on the Russians regularly to, to not veto such a resolution. Thank you. As, as you all reflect on that and maybe want to weigh in, let me just remind folks, we will take questions from you all. My team can be collecting the questions and bringing them up. Um, so my team, there are some hands up in the air, and we'll, we'll take those. But you got to write down a piece of paper, Alex. All right, uh, Amy or Rebecca, any thoughts about this? this concept, you can take a pass or you can weigh in. Are we talking about reinforcing the taboo? Well, or, or Mort's idea or other ways to reinforce the taboo. Um, first, I'd like to point out that the United States has signed up to a legally binding negative security assurance in the protocol to the Treaty of Tlatelolco, the Latin American nuclear weapons free zone. And there are similar protocols to other nuclear weapons free zones, which unfortunately haven't made it through the Senate yet. But the concept of a legally binding promise not to threaten or use nuclear weapons is not foreign to the United States, the legally binding part of it. It's that we always seem to make them conditional. In the ones that are politically binding, the things that appear in nuclear posture reviews, there are conditions under which it wouldn't hold. No, they're not. Yeah, I mean, the nuclear posture review, we say we won't use or threaten to use nuclear weapons against a non-nuclear weapon state that is uh, in compliance with its uh, non-proliferation obligations. It's broader than NPT. And, but we leave open the possibility of using nuclear weapons in retaliation against a nuclear weapon state, even if it doesn't use nuclear weapons, i.e. Right. North Korea hits Seoul with artillery. So it's conditional. But in the Treaty of Tlatelolco, it's unconditional. No threats, no use against parties to that treaty. So the condition is on who gets to receive the security assurance. I don't think we could amend the NPT to do that for all countries, parties to the NPT, just because of the uh, amendment process requiring all the states. But there are other mechanisms that you kind of start with. We have a conditional negative security assurance, and we start finding legal mechanisms to peel off some of the conditions instead of coming up with an unconditional one and trying to make it legal. I have no idea how that would work, but it's just a different pathway. All right. I, just real quickly, I would also mention that um, there is the Central Asia Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Treaty, which uh, has been sitting in the Senate for quite some time. Um, that would be something that uh, should support we get bipartisan support now, especially given what we're seeing happening uh, in that particular region. Um, all right, Rebecca, let me come back to the, 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 the question you knew I was coming back to, which is given the, the fissures uh, between uh, the states who are on different sides or neutral about the Russian war in Ukraine uh, and the fissures between states that depend on nuclear deterrence and those that don't, I mean, what can be done moving forward, um, and we saw some of this play out at the G7 in Hiroshima, to bring together the opinion and consensus that um, we have seen in various forms. I mean, what, what are your recommendations on, on that? Great. So first I'll start and say I think you're absolutely right. What we're seeing is um, a polarization. So if you are already um, prone to rely on, or 
if you relied on nuclear deterrence or extended nuclear deterrence, the war in Ukraine made countries or populations feel that deterrence is more important than ever. And I've heard a lot of people say that in the US too. Um, but if you were already against nuclear weapons, then you look at what's happened in Ukraine, you look at Putin being able to use nuclear weapons as a shield to, to um, prosecute this war, to engage in war crimes, uh, to kill civilians and combatants, including you know, hundreds of thousands of his own citizens, then I think the message on that side, or the, the lesson there is no, no one should have these nuclear weapons, right? So we do see that, that uh, polarization. I think what's happening with those relying on deterrence is, is, is a very understandable response to fear, right? We saw this with like the stockpiling of iodine pills um, after the war began in Europe. We've seen the increase in people creating bunkers again. Um, because they're, fear they're fearful. I, I, I think that that fear response is natural and understandable, but maybe in the long run, once we get beyond that, maybe we'll you know, think back, or maybe some folks who think that will think, well, actually, maybe he shouldn't have had these nuclear weapons in the first place, and if we don't think Putin should have them, then maybe you get more of a consideration of disarmament, that no one should be in this position to be able to use their shield to be aggressive towards non-nuclear weapon states. Um, and then in terms of uh, reinforcing that tab the taboo, I mean, I think has been pointed out that I think Biden has been very um, responsible in his responses to Putin. Um, I don't think we, we want to condemn kind of callous nuclear talk. We don't want any more Twitter uh, nuclear threats on Twitter. I mean, I think just condemning those, any kind of like loose talk about, about nuclear weapons use I think is important. Um, my, my big issue is that I think that we need greater salience of this issue in the public. So you mentioned at the outset this morning that there was that poll of Americans of how they thought the world would end, right, in nuclear weapons. Greatest threats to the end of the greatest world. Greatest threats to the end of the world. And I think it's one thing to put a survey before people and put those options and they're like, oh yeah, nuclear weapons. But if you just ask an average person going through their lives anything about nuclear weapons, I don't think it comes to top of mind, right? And so I think that's a real problem that we have is that of course in this room it is, but I mean, you know, other people we speak with, um, my own students, I mean, this is just not an issue. You know, when they think end of the world, they think climate change, maybe global pandemic, um, now so many people are worried about AI, but I don't think that they think of nuclear weapons as this existential threat. And I think if we are going to move in a way to really reduce the dangers of nuclear weapons, that that, that salience is going to have to increase, that the that leaders should be talking about what it means. So for example, when Putin says, you're gonna see consequences you've never seen before, well, let's pull that apart and talk about what does he actually mean there? It doesn't sound like that's a demonstration shot, right? That sounds like, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki plus. And so I think really talking about the consequences, this is where the humanitarian effort I think was really important in teaching a new generation of diplomats about the consequences of nuclear weapons. I think it's unfortunate that the most recent humanitarian conference came along the day before the TPNW um, first meeting of states parties because I think that meant countries that were against the treaty were not necessarily gonna show up for the consequences part. And I think we can all agree on the devastating consequences of nuclear weapons. Uh, I think it's important that we're seeing more voices brought into the discussion. So Marshall Islanders, um, Kazakhs, downwinders in the US, all these people who have been affected both from mining and testing, bringing their voices in so people understand it's not just, you know, nuclear weapons have had negative effects on the environment and populations and communities beyond just what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? And I think people need to understand that. Um, and then lastly, this is, this is a really um, an issue that's primed for intersectionality, but I don't think we're seeing the full capacity yet. There's issues of race and justice and environmentalism um, that form a nice nexus with nuclear weapons. Um, and so advocates, there's health issues, right? There's advocates who want to teach people about nuclear weapons. I think there's a lot of room to be working, not in just our silo of people who are concerned about the threats of nuclear weapons. Yeah, definitely, and, and just on that last point, I, mean, I would just add that uh, as we look back at the, the history of the movement against the bomb, um, when different movements have come together on this subject and related subjects, we've seen a lot of success. And there's an excellent book by uh, my friend and colleague Vincent Antandi about the June 12th uh, 
1982 rally that, that represents um, uh, that effect. So I'm being a bad moderator because I'm, 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 we're behind, behind time. Um, I want to ask Amy an important question, but I want to ask you to uh, answer it briefly. Um, and then we got to get to a couple audience questions. Um, we're obviously stuck for the indefinite future with tensions, with the dangers of deterrence, um, uh, the benefits and the dangers of deterrence. Um, so, I mean, what specific recommendations would you have for U.S. and Russian and at least maybe Chinese policymakers about specific risk reduction options that can reduce the risk of, of use and miscalculation based upon your study of this field for so long? Well, the first one, uh, to reduce the risk of nuclear use or nuclear threats is agree not to invade your neighbors. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, once you cross the first border, it gets harder. Um, but in the absence of that, to avoid provocative engagements, um, don't fly your airplane so close that you hit the rudder on our drone. And if you do hit the rudder on our drone, please pick up the phone when we call. And the, the, the don't fly your airplanes right across the bow of our ships. Or if we're in Asia, don't put your put our surveillance plane in the wake of your fighter jet. I and mean, there's a lot of risky behavior that's going on, risk-seeking behavior, that has the risk of escalating. So it's a rules of the road issue. We had the incidents at sea agreement. You know, we've tried to deal with those kinds of risky behaviors through guardrails in the past. And if we need to sit back down and put those guardrails back in and put communications channels back up, it's a place to start. Um, secure available communications and people who answer the phones. Yeah, that really would help. Um, at the core, though, the, the answer to risk accepting behavior, you know, these aren't accidents, these things that have been happening in the last 12 months, 18 months. Russia has chosen to be risk accepting. China, last week, chose to be risk accepting. And in, it's hard to do risk reduction with someone who believes the risk, the manipulation of risk, gives them an advantage. And then that takes you back to deterrence. There has to be some price to be paid or some risk of response to the risk accepting behavior. And I know this sounds like jargon, but if there's no consequence, if Russia just keeps flying its planes by the bows of our ships or up close without its transponders on and we send out a little diplomatic notice, it's not going to stop. And I'm not sure what those responsive measures are, but they come in that category of the consequences you will face will exceed the benefits you get. Our risk will not be manipulated, yours will be. And if you think about risk reduction as something you do to avoid accidents, you forget that risk reduction often happens in a risk-seeking environment. So it gets back to the beginning. You need to avoid the risk-seeking environment, yeah. make it a rule that you don't invade your neighbors. But there really are no good answers if a nation is seeking to manipulate the risk. Mark, do you want to weigh in? So I would, to I agree with all of that. I would reinforce it with one other thing. Don't yawn when a nuclear power seizes the territory of another country. Uh, but I also want to say the reverse side of that, which is I think we should eliminate the policy of launch on warning. I think the risk of a surprise attack is far, far less than the risk of an accidental nuclear war. And we can reduce that risk by simply saying if, if we think there's an attack, we'll wait to be certain before we fire our own weapons. I agree with that one. All right, we have, a, I think, an important question that maybe should have been asked at the very beginning of this um, that I want more to address first here, um, which I think goes to the, the, the question here is essentially, what is a nuclear threat? Uh, and the question is, every time the United States president or another president of a nuclear armed country says, all options are on the table, isn't that a threat to use nuclear weapons? Um, and, and, and so I think this goes back to, Amy, you were, you were taking apart what Putin actually said and pointing out that he was reminding us that he has nuclear weapons, and yet that has been widely interpreted as a threat. And there are other forms, and more, you know about this very well, 1969, November, the secret nuclear alert, other forms of nuclear signaling that have actually been threats without saying, if you do this, I'm gonna 
annihilate you with nuclear weapons. I mean, so what is a nuclear threat and what forms does it come in? And are there good ones or are there bad ones? Well, I think we maybe need some more s differentiating terminology to talk about verbal nuclear threats and signals which imply the possibility that we use nuclear weapons. There are other people who object to, to calling them threats. They actually say they're actually using nuclear weapons. We're using, we're using the threat, and therefore that's an actual use. Uh, but I think they're all actions which raise in your opponent's mind the possibility that nuclear weapons will be used either deliberately or, as Tom Schelling put it, the threat that leaves something to chance, that somehow it will lead to the use of nuclear weapons. All right. On that note, we're going to end this sobering discussion. I want to thank each of you for some really great contributions on one of the hardest topics that we all deal with in this field. Please join me with a round of applause.